Uh, her Tong Young Yen, and uh, she's been at the Harm now for two years, right? Two years, um, and she has really, um, really been a major force in uh, working on the collection at the Harm. As many of you know, if you've been there, you know that there's an extensive collection at the Harm. There are over uh, 3,000 works covering many, many centuries, and so. Um, and she's worked on that. And these are in all kinds of media, uh, you know, from uh, jades, metalwork, stone sculptures, paintings, and prints. Um, and she has been, you know, done a lot of uh, research on these things to make them. Right now, there is an exhibit up that you haven't seen it. You have until April to go to it. And there, this is the one which is about uh, women in uh, Asian art. And if you got the little blurb today, it said that that was the talk, but that was a mistake. Okay, we're actually gonna talk about something else. But definitely you might wanna go to that uh, one at the Horn. Uh, it goes back to the seventh century and up to the present. And so you're really looking at uh, how women are represented in Asian art and how they you know, represent how end them as artists. So it's really worth going to. Um, I just, I don't want to take too much time here, but I do want to just uh, let you know that uh, we have uh, Han Yin, who was, uh, an, well, she's done an incredible number of things. She was actually a curator at two museums before she came here. These were both in Illinois, and then she came here. She got her PhD from where? It was, um, at the University of California, right? And before that, she got you know a variety of other uh, degrees, including one at the uh, uh, her master's and bachelor of arts from I don't know how you pronounce it, Renmin yes. Renmin uh -huh. University in China in Beijing. Okay, I'm going to stop there and let you take over and tell us about the talk today, which is about an upcoming exhibit, which is not up yet, but will be there before too long. And this is about Himalayan art. Uh, good morning, and thank you so much, Laura, for this very um, kind introduction. And uh, I'm very happy, and for the invitation uh, today. So I'm very happy to be back to Okamak and to I see some old friends and also to meet some new friends here. Uh, so um, as Laura introduced, I'm the new, not really that new anymore, but still <laughs> relatively new. I've been at the position for two and a half years. So I'm working basically on the Asian art collection. Uh, research and doing exhibitions and work with all the museum staff to develop some programs as well. Uh, so today's topic is introduction to Himalayan art. So this is um, about an upcoming exhibition, like a very exciting project. Uh, we have been working on diligently in the past few months. Um, so the Himalayan art is this is a traveler exhibition coming from the New York City, from the Rubin Museum uh, in New York of art in New York. Uh, some of you might have already visited the places before. They have one of the best Himalayan collections outside the Himalayan region in the world. So we are very lucky and excited to uh, host this exhibition at the Har. Um, so today's exhibition is, um, uh, today's talk is mainly about some of the works that you will be able to see. Um, thank you. Sure. Um, you will see when the show opens. So just a, like a very uh, brief introduction about this exhibition. So the exhibition is going to be held at the Harm Museum on February 13th. It's going to run for um, over five months, ends on July 26th next year. So, um, and the exhibition is going to feature uh, about 80 pieces of work of art, all from the Ruby Museum of Art's permanent collection. And the artworks uh, include sculptures, paintings, manuscripts, and a lot of ritual implements uh, from Himalayan regions. So it's the main idea is to introduce the major forms, the concepts, meanings, and also some of the religious practices um, of Himalayan um, community. 
and the exhibition is going to be organized in three themes. So the first is um, symbols and meanings. It will introduce lots of different uh, icons and motifs uh, you will see in Himalayan art and what are the symbolic and religious meanings. And the second uh, focuses on materials and technology. So uh, that part we'll share with you like what kind of different wood, metal, and um, you know, fabric, different materials used and what kind of different techniques developed for different uh, objects. And the third part is living practice. So that mainly from the, um, the, the Himalaya uh, community, the, the, the religious practitioners perspective to talk about how these uh, different ritual objects, how different artistic motifs have been continually used um, and um, played significant roles in Himalayan uh, community until this day. So today my talk is we because uh, I mentioned there were like over 80 uh, pieces of work I won't be able to cover a lot, but I hope through this talk I can introduce a much broader geographical culture uh, historical and religious context uh, for you to prepare yourself for the for the exhibition. And also I hope by looking closely at a few objects paintings sculptures and other uh, implements. Uh, we will learn a little bit about some some tools, some visual tools. Um, so when you go see the um, exhibition, look at the objects, that tools could help you to uh, appreciate and better understand um, the objects in the exhibition. So before we get into Himalayan art, first let's talk about Himalayan region. So I include a map here. So Himalayan region um, in a very narrow sense, a really means uh, uh, geographical regions around the um, Himalayan mountains, this area. So it, it, including the areas of um, uh, Tibetan Plateau, uh, Nepal, Bhutan, and, and northernmost region of India and um, Pakistan. But in this exhibition, we actually use Himalayan region or Himalayan culture in a relatively broader sense. So when we talk about Himalayan culture and art in this, for these particular exhibition projects, we also include the surrounding regions, a broader surrounding regions to the north and east of the Tibetan Plateau, uh, where Himalayan art and religious um, exerted a very strong influence. For example, in the cult culture in China from the 13th, all the way, 13th century all the way to the early 20th century, and even regions in Mongolia and um, southeastern uh, Siberia and um, and northern part of Burma. So this exhibition, we see like Himalayan art and regions. So you will see objects coming from a much broader area. So Himalayan art. So when we talk about Himalayan art, it's, mere, uh, it's primarily concerns with secret or religious artworks. So those artworks uh, have a, um, because of their very unique composition and their very distinctive symbols and motifs used in these works. So they are very easily recognizable. And most of the symbols and motifs are actually drawn from the, the, the major religions uh, predominant in these regions. Um, for example, like the Buddhism, the Hinduism, and some of the indigenous uh, religious beliefs, like the Bon religious belief, um, uh, popular in Tibet area. So now let's um, go over briefly about these uh, three uh, major primary uh, religions religions in this area. So first, Buddhism. We all know like Buddhism was funded by a historical figure. Siddhartha Gautama um, around the 6th century BCE. And he was a Nepal prince of uh, Shaka clan. And um, he was also known as a historical Buddha. So his teaching became the foundation of Buddhism, which is one of the major religions in the world. So at the core of the Buddhism is a belief in four noble truths, which is uh, the Buddhism, the, the Buddhists identify the suffering's existence. And they also uh, identify the main causes of the, all these sufferings, and they acknowledge that the, the main purpose of a Buddhist uh, goal is to um, terminate all this suffering. 
through the different uh, method. The method is you have to follow the Buddha's teaching, like the, the major uh, noble eight paths, eightfold paths, but, um, to speak the right words, to do the right thing, live the uh, right livelihood, etc. So the main goal for the Buddhist or the, um, the, the Buddhism is for uh, the people, the believers, to reach enlighten, um, enlightenment, which means to, um, to achieve, um, to, to, to achieve like a, a true um, understanding of the nature and also to be liberated from all these sufferings. Mainly it's it mentioned like this, the cycle of life, death and rebirth. So the spread of Buddhism started right after the lifetime of Buddha, the historical Buddha, uh, Shakyamuni. And, um, it, but it was not until seventh century, so Buddhism reached Tibetan, the Himalayan region, and gradually become a dominant religious in that area. Um, as the Buddhism spread throughout the Himalayan region, it kind of merged with the, all the different other uh, indigenous beliefs. Um, and formed a very unique school, which is we also called Vajrayana Buddhism. Um, and also some of you might know this uh, particular Buddhist uh, school by their uh, by its different names like Tibetan Buddhism and esoteric Buddhism or uh, Tantric Buddhism. So we, um, there are like a very uh, slight differences between each names, but in this exhibition, in these projects, we kind of use these uh, different terms as ex exchangeable names for this uh, Buddhist school. Oops, not yet, sorry. So another, um, the second uh, religion, major religion, um, a, a set, has a, a strong influence in Tibetan area is Hinduism. Hinduism is also one of the world's oldest religions. It originated in the um, Indian subcontinent, and it has five elements that shaped the beliefs and tradition, which are doctrines, practice, society, story, and devotion. So um, the, Himala well, the Himalayan region are known for their rich Buddhist tradition. Hinduism has also played a, vet, a vital role in shaping the culture and the art, especially in Nepal. So we will see a few examples like uh, we can see like the Hindu gods and the Buddhist gods are actually coexisted and worshiped together. Sometimes even um, the same god uh, have different uh, Buddhist and Hindu names. And also the, the third one is Bon religion. So Bon religion is an ancient religious tradition predated Buddhism um, in Tibet. So it roots in the indigenous beliefs and ancestor worships. Uh, so throughout, over time, it has developed into a very complex, uh, complex and organized religious system. So after the arrival of Buddhism in Tibet, so Bon has persisted and influenced certain aspects of Tibetan Buddhism. I will show you an example as well. So in this religion, we have uh, many um, Buddhist paintings, paintings from Tibetan, uh, from Himalayan region. So um, maybe you, uh, some of you probably have already seen uh, this type of paintings before in different uh, museums. So it's like I mentioned, it has a very unique uh, composition and vibrant color and bright colors and has a very complicated um, uh, icons represented on the paintings. So I want to use this panel um, to show the the basic rules for the composition and some of the ideas how we are going to read these uh, uh, Himalayan paintings. So the Himalayan, um, the paintings um, are normally uh, are presented in a symbolic hierarchical order. So we started from the top. So the top here normally represented the top in the center as the teacher or the root deity. So this root deity normally represents the God where this particular teaching originated from. And um, these two figures uh, flanking the central God are normally teachers because, because it is very important in Tibetan Buddhism is a path along of the lineage. So the teaching normally passed from teacher to disciples. So this kind of lineage teacher and the masters play a significant role in in, in disseminating the teaching of the central Buddha here. 
So this is why they are represented on the top register here. And in the center is normally the main figure of its entire painting. We can see the figure, the god here, the, or sometimes goddess, are represented in a much larger size. So um, this central figure is um, represents uh, the, 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 the deity who pass on, pass on and also represents a major quality of the, the top root deity's teaching. And most of the time we can use uh, hand gestures and body postures and some of the, you know, the, the accessories or implements uh, the deity holds to identify his, his or her identity. And on the two sides, we will see different, um, sometimes disciples, sometimes other type of deities here as part of this central deity entourage. And the landscape usually um, painted at the background to set the stage for this narrative and also served as these visual divisions for each uh, sections. And on the bottom, bottom register, normally you will see this very um, fierce looking god. Uh, we call them raspal god and god or goddess sometimes. So these serve as a protector for the Buddha's teaching and for this central uh, deity. So this is like the hierarchical orders, how to identify the central deity through the, 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 the mandras, uh, the mudras, like the hand gestures, and how to understand the very complex relationships of, uh, of different part of this uh, painting. So now we move on to talk about some of the major icons, so who, who are represented, who are depicted, in, or who are you oftenly seen. Um, in this Himalayan art. So the first and the major figure obviously is Buddha. So Buddha means a weakened person, which means um, this person has re reached enlightenment, uh, had seen the true nature of the reality, and also be liberated from the, the cycle of um, death, births, and rebirths. So the, uh, so the Buddha, at the, at the beginning, at the very beginning of the Buddhism, there is only one Buddha. We call it historical Buddha, like Shakyamuni. But with the spread and expand of Buddhism and its practice throughout the centuries followed. And um, so different regions developed uh, different ideas of multiple Buddhas. So in this exhibition, we will also see the Buddha of the future, Maitreya Buddha. And also in Tibetan tradition, there are lots of different tantric Buddhas as well. So multiple Buddha represent different cap uh, capabilities and different functions. So here, take a closer look of this painting. Oops, sorry. That's a line, wrong one, okay. Uh, so the Buddha is sitting in the center, it's presented in a very formal and uh, very uh, elegant posture, and he is presented uh, very, in a very symmetrical way. So this is a, one of the most in, important characteristics of Himalayan art. So the painting is uh, the composition, uh, the symmetry of the composition is very important. And we see the Buddha was sitting in the center, and how do we know it's a Buddha? Because first of all, like look at the top of his head, he has a, a, a protruding part, a bump on his head. Some of the scholars thought it might be a top knot of his hair piled on the top of the head. And some scholars interpretation is this is a cranial bump. So to show his um, enlightened status. And it was uh, topped again with another jewel on the very um, top of the, the, the knob. And uh, in between the eyes, you will see a, a white um, dot. It's called Varna. Um, so it's another symbol of his spiritual uh, status. And Buddha is always depicted with very long, elongated ear lobes, so which is a symbol of he, his renunciations from his previous uh, prince. Uh, uh, life as a prince. And he doesn't have any uh, jewelries, no crown, no jewelries, no braces, nothing, no any uh, 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 ornaments adorn him. And he wears a very simple patchwork robe, which um, which is uh, which um, based on the legend, the story is uh, when he reached enlightenment, he treated his, you know, his clothes uh, of uh, royal clothes with this very simple 
um, and plain um, uh, patchwork rope. And here the Buddha seated on a moon disk, on a lotus throne and supported by the lines, white lines here. And the way he seated with his right leg over left leg is called a Vajra posture. And his hand gesture here with his right hand with the finger pointing to, toward the ground. This is a particular hand gesture. Uh, so touching ground gest hand gesture to um, indicate the movement of his enlightenment, like he's summoning the, 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 the goddess of the, the earth to witness at the moment of his enlightenment. And his left hand is in a meditation mudra, but holding a, a vase, a black, vase a, a black bow here as a begging bow is another uh, symbol of his identity. And he is surrounded by these halos in different colors. And here, this painting, particular painting, depicts a Buddha Shakyamuni with a heart. So a heart is like the, 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 the figure standing uh, surrounding him here. So Ahart historically refers to his original, the Buddhas, historical Buddhas, original um, disciples, like his first followers. So it, it started with six figures, then gradually developed into 18. Then later, if you went to some um, temples in um, East Asia, you might see like the depiction of 108 Ahart's. Ahart's. Yeah. Here, the second um, bodhisattva. So bodhisattva are beings who became awakened like the Buddha, so they also reached enlightenment, but they dedicated not to enter nirvana yet. So they stayed on earth and in this world to help the others to attain the same goal. So how, to, how do we distinguish Buddha and Bodhisattva? So the most um, direct uh, characteristic of Bodhisattva is, oh, is Bodhisattva are normally heavily uh, adorned with all, uh, all kinds of jewels and crowns and bracelets, all these decorations uh, across their body. This is the thing, uh, uh, this is a feature to indicate they are still part of this world, not really uh, reached Nirvana yet. So this particular bodhisattva is Shitigapha. So Shitigapha, um, we know this because there is an inscription on the base, on the back of the base of this particular um, work. So we know his uh, identity. So this Shitigapha uh, bodhisattva is particularly associated uh, with bringing help and comfort to those in the underworld realm of hell. So here we see like, um, it is, um, if you are familiar with um, East Asian Chinese Bodhisattva, like the Guanyin, like the Avalakitajwala, you probably will notice that how these Bodhisattva in Himalayan art actually are so very visually different from those uh, represented in East Asian art. So here we see like the, the, the Bodhisattva the very um, unique poster, contrapostal poster, meaning like the whole body bended in three directions. We see the head and the lower limb uh, all bent towards one direction and body to the opposite direction. So it really brings a, sweep, a, a movement to this figure. And also for Himalayan art, as we will see in the following examples as well. So the aim of the artist is not really to imitate nature or to recreate a real uh, figure, but to construct an idea of beauty and idea, ide idealized figure and body shape. So the next one is tantric deities. So um, tantric deities uh, refers to all these deities in uh, Himalayan religion. So tantras, um, uh, initially, uh, initially means instruct, instructional texts. So A was uh, normally written in a format of a dialogue between a god and a goddess. So they offer that these tantras, these texts offers an alternative route to enlightenment through its very intense concentrations and uh, some special meditations. So the, the main goal of this, uh, by using these tantras or these instru instructional texts is to speed up one person's, uh, the process of enlightenment of um, the liberation. Because in uh, 
Buddhism in the other school of Buddhism, one has to go sometimes one has to go, go through several lives to finally reach to eventually reach the enlightenment. But by using in Tibetan uh, in Himalayan uh, Buddhist by using this particular tantras or instru instructional texts, one could swiftly and radically transformed um, the conventional understanding of re reality. So you can probably reach um, uh, enlightenment in your uh, in this particular in one lifetime. So in these uh, tantras, in these texts, many deities were mentioned and depicted. So sometimes these deities are also referred as tantras. So those deities are personified um, versions of these qualities for enlightenment. For example, the two one we will repeatedly uh, mention in this talk, and you will see in the exhibitions as well, two major ones are first wisdom. This is a main goal for you to understand the reality and also the method, how to reach uh, um, the wisdom, how to attain the wisdom. The other way is the method. So wisdom and method are always uh, united together. So some of the deities painted, like the tantric deities we will see in Himalayan art, are actually the personified um, versions of these qualities. So on this painting um, here in the center, so we, we like we mentioned, we talk about the top root deities and major central figures and the bottom, like the protectors. So now we start from the central figure here. So if you can, I'm not sure if you can see it from um, this image. So there are two figures holding each other. One is um, a male, a deity, male figure with a black face. Actually, he has four faces. The frontal one is black. There is a, a yellow one. There is a green one. There is a white one. So four faces, uh, faces four has this deity. And he has 12 arms, all in blue, and two legs, uh, stopping on two figures here. So different arms holding different uh, ritual implements. Some are knives, some are vajra, some are bells, some are like the, the, the tassel. And um, on the top of his head, he has a crown of um, made of uh, human skulls, like a five, five skulls. And he's wearing a necklace also made of skulls, the head of the humans, and also the, 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 the the, the hair around his waist as well, and also wearing a uh, lower skirts of, uh, can you see? I'm not sure. It's a tiger skin um, skirt like that. And um, so that particular figure is um, Chakra Samvara, Chakra Samvara. And she is, oh, sorry, he is embraced by his consort, Vajravarahi here. The consort is a female deity. She has one head. Um, how many um, hands? Um, multiple hands, I think. Like the two arms holding, embracing the father. Uh, sometimes it's the male is identified as a father, and the female identified as a mother goddess. So it's a, the, he's holding the um, the father, and also uh, looks uh, a bit with a very restful um, expressions and holding different um, accessories in her hand. So this uh, the embrace. So actually, this is, is a depiction of a sexual union, a sexual embrace. So this is uh, you will see these kind of representations in Himalaya a lot. So here, like I mentioned, these tantric deities actually are per personified qualities of enlightenment aspects. So the male, the father, the chakras, uh, chakras, chakras samvara represent uh, the method how to reach enlightenment, the method through uh, compassionate actions. And the female deities is a representation of um, the wisdom, the understanding of the true reality. So here, their sexual union actually means the unity of the method and also the final goals. So these type of uh, representations is very common in uh, Himalayan art. And also here, I would love to mention uh, you will see lots of, uh, you know, human head or skulls, skull cups, the cups made in, uh, from uh, human skulls in even in our exhibition and also like a very common motif in uh, Himalayan Buddhism. So some of the audiences might ask, um, 
why they use this, uh, you know, human bones or human skulls or head or that, that motif uh, in their in this art. So, uh, what is the difference from Himalayan representation from the other like uh, human remains we discussed in today's uh, museum collections? So, the the main idea, I think, the main difference is here uh, Himalayan art, the material, like uh, you will see in the exhibition, the material play a significant role in these religious practice and in these symbolic meanings. Human head and also the, the, the skull um, the skull cups actually uh, referred has a very strong symbolic religious meaning um, of impermanence of human life. So it means like everything you see, you own, you try to uh, hold on in this life is all impermanent. It's not like the uh, the, and it shouldn't be the, the main goal or final goal of your of anyone's life. So this is and also it was uh, made the material uh, was choose for this particular religious meaning and function. So that is why it's so different from you know the other human remains probably um, you found from the tombs or it was repurposed or reused uh, uh, or recollected in museum collections. So female deities are also a very common motif in Himalayan art because in Himalayan Buddhism, um, all these material realities were actually considered being animated by female forces. So that's why worship of the female deities play a very significant role in Himalayan Buddhism. So female deities uh, occupied a very high and important positions in this, uh, not only religion, but art. So, um, so Tara here, so this is a female deity of Tara. So Tara is one of the most popular female deities in uh, Himalayan art in Tibetan Buddhism. It also considered as um, the female Buddha in uh, Himalayan Buddhism. So the, the, uh, the story about um, Tara is um, that when we know like Avalokitashvala is a major bodhisattva of co um, compassion. So when uh, Avalokitashvala, the compassion body, bodhisattva, witnessed the suffering of uh, the human world, uh, she was so, uh, the bodhisattva was so overwhelmed and shed two tears. So the two tears turned into Taras. One is green Tara, like we see here, green Tara. Another one is wet Tara. So green Tara is the most popular um, uh, female deity in, uh, in Tibet. Um, so how do we um, um, identify uh, green Tara? So green Tara normally is associated with flowers, plants, or nature motifs. So here we see like she's holding two uh, lotus and uh, also um, with some flowers uh, in her hair. So Tara is not only associated with a protection uh, for people and um, with a protection um, of people to, uh, uh, to be free from all the fears. So the fears could be external fears like the, the natural disasters or earthquake, fire, and it could also be the internal obstacles uh, for people to reach enlightenment. So uh, the Tara has that particular power. And, um, is be and also like um, I would like to mention here is like the female deities in Tibetan art, we can see has very distinct uh, physical features like a oval shaped face and very round bodies and also sometimes smaller uh, size in comparison to some male uh, deities. Uh, this is also restful deities. We mentioned these sometimes are depicted on the paintings uh, for particular Buddhist teaching as protectors of the Buddha or Bodhisattva. And um, this Mahakala, oops, this Mahakala um, um, uh, deity is uh, one of the uh, major uh, restful deities in Tibetan um, Buddhism. So we can see from these uh, very standardized depictions with this uh, flame shaped high, uh, hair and also bulging eyes and widely open mouth. And you can sometimes see these very sharp teeth and fangs there. 
so like I mentioned, when Buddhism um, spread to Tibetan areas, so it was merged with local, with indigenous uh, religious, what is a Bon religious in Tibet. So Makala was original, uh, uh, was originally a Tibetan Bon, um, the god from the Bon religious belief. So um, he was uh, he became the followers of the of Buddha, and also by bond he uh, became the protectors uh, of uh, Buddhism teachings. So in Himalayan Buddhism, we see normally two types of these restful deities. One is enlightened ones, so they have already uh, reached um, enlightenment. But they put on these uh, fierce disguise to become protectors of the other followers. And another type, the second type, is this Mahakala um, uh, deity. So as a restful deity is uh, is from ind indigenous religions, and they are not enlightened, but they bound by their words to protect uh, Buddhist uh, Buddhist Buddhist followers. And here we see he's holding a a skull cup and a knife on the other hand and carry a baton uh, at the crook of his arm so this is to uh, as a as a single as a as a two to summon all the monks uh, for the monks assembly this is another one like the hindu god and goddesses are also uh, seen uh, in himalayan buddhist art like I mentioned, uh, in Nepal, in some regions of Himalayan areas, uh, Buddhism and Hinduism were um, worshipped um, side by side, and uh, the god and goddess were also coexisted. And the artists who sometimes created Buddhist art are also the artists who made uh, who, who who made this uh, Hindu art as well. So we can see like this very similar compositions, the similar material use and the colors and even the hand gestures and the facial uh, body features are quite similar as well. So this particular red Avalokitashvala has a different name in Hinduism. In, um, so it's in, in Nepal, um, Hindu uh, worship is called um, Vongadaya. So it's the same name, it's a uh, same deity, same bodhisattva, but has two different names, one in Buddhist name, one Hindu name here. So this particular god is, um, you see on the top of uh, his crown is a seated image of the future Buddha, Maitreya, and also the other Hindu goddess surrounding this, um, this um, Buddhist god in the center, and the patrons like a celebration, uh, participating in these celebrations are depicted at the bottom. So this type of image, this red Avalokiteshvara, or in Hindu is called Bungadaya, or worshipped um, and do, uh, especially used for the its annual celebration before the the arrival of the monsoon season in Nepal area. And humans, humans, the teachers, the legendary, the, the masters are also very important in not only passing on the, the teaching of Buddhas, but also become a very important uh, figures in, uh, in, uh, in, in Himalayan um, politics as well. So the Dalai Lama, I think everybody is familiar with this, is uh, it literally means superior ones. It's the head of the dominant yellow hat order of Tibetan Buddhism. So Tibetan Buddhism has different schools as well. So there is one like Galu school, it's a yellow hat order. Um, it's a very uh, major uh, school in Tibetan Buddhism. So Dalai Lama is a spiritual leader of Tibetan Buddhism. So his status is expressed through the succession through reincarnation. So we know like when, um, when Dalai Lama passed away, there is a, uh, there is a very uh, complex and long procedure to find the his reincarnation and to find the second, uh, the next Dalai Lama. So this ritual practice started in uh, late 14th century, I think it's 1390s. And um, so today we have the 13th, so um, reincarnation. Today is the current Dalai Lama is the 14th um, Dalai Lama re reincarnation of Avalaki Tashvala. So Dalai Lama is considered uh, to be the reincarnation of the compassionate bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, we talk about um, we saw some images here. So this painting depicted 
the fifth Dalai Lama who was active in the during the 17th century. So he's a very important, not a religious figure, but also a political figure, because he was the first theocratic ruler of the United Tibet. And as, as I mentioned, Dalai Lama um, identified himself as an incarnation of the Bodhisattva of compassion, Avalokiteshvara. So here we can see um, him depicted, depicted in the center. And on the top left here, there is another figure. This is a historical figure um, who uh, is a founder of the Tibetan Empire in the seventh century, Songzhen Gyanpo. And he is also uh, considered as the emanation of Avalokiteshvara. So that's why uh, he's depicted here. And in the center, like we mentioned, the root deity um, is uh, the, the Buddha, uh, the, the Buddha here in the center. So um, we see like the, the Dalai Lama is holding um, a long life waist in his left hands. So this is an indication like this painting was uh, painted during his lifetime. And uh, there are some registrations um, um, recording the, the, the moment of this painting and all the other uh, followers and uh, disciples. So the functions, the um, Himalaya art has different functions, although they are mostly like uh, religious or uh, sacred works, but they still uh, we classify their different functions and motivations for the production of these artworks into these seven um, categories, uh, devotional, didactic, narrative, utilitarian, and, uh, and so on. So some objects can have um, overlapped functions. So the functions are not really exclusive from each other. So for example, some ritual objects uh, could be used as a gift uh, to uh, give um, to, to the to, as a gift uh, for the teachers of the temples or the uh, monasteries, and sometimes the objects created, uh, for example, as commodity, if they were later used and owned by a Buddhist master. So the after the master passed away, that particular commodity or objects will be looked at as sacred objects. So the the functions of the objects are not fixed but fluid. It's changed. Um, uh, within different context. So here is an example of a painting talking about uh, uh, serving a didactic function in Himalayan uh, meditation and worship. Um, so this painting is a diagram that explains the uh, cyclical process of life, death, and rebirth, like we cite the, uh, the cycles. Um, so here, this is a very complicated thing, but if you look into the detail, it's very interesting, lots of information here. Here we see this a center figure here is a very um, monstrous looking figure. It's a Yama, it's a, it's a Tibetan indigenous god of hell. So it's a lord of hell, he controls hell. Uh, he's holding a wheel here. And in the center of the wheel, the wheel is driven by the three animals in the center. Um, I think th this is a rooster here. So rooster represents um, um, the attachment. So these are actually the three poisons that cause all the sufferings of uh, one's life. So rooster represents attachment. And there is another one, snake. I believe it's here. So snake is uh, a symbol of, sorry, anger. And another one, probably here, right? Pit. Pig is a symbol of ignorance. So these are three poisons that driven the, the cycle of life, birth, death, and rebirth. And the next cycle, uh, in the next circle from the central, we see uh, people moving upward to the light. So meaning when you reach to the light status, that means you reach the status of consciousness and you're going downwards to the darkness this is a afflicted status. And the next two um, sections um, are, the, are the six realms. The six realms, the next cycle here are the six realms represented in uh, three different parts about the continuous cycle of rebirth. 
So five sections here portray the six realms of existence. We see God and goddess, and we see humans, and we see animals. Uh, so lower left, here are animals, and here are hungry ghosts, and this is the worst part, the lowest part is the hell here. And uh, so the will's outer rim, this, are divided into uh, 12 uh, compartments. So this is a symbolic chain of causality. So the 12 links, like what the cause of your suffering and the, the result of your suffering. So, so different, different things like greed, like anger, like different uh, causes of the sufferings. So here we see on the top, outside the, uh, the ring, there are Buddha, like two Buddhas. This is uh, um, the Buddha, uh, the historical Buddha, because he has already reached enlightenment. He sees the true reality of everything, the cause of, of the sufferings, sufferings. So he is liberated from this cyclical uh, circle. So now he's standing outside the will and um, pointing towards, a, po using his finger to represent his teaching. And on the right side of this painting, there is another Buddha, the Buddha of the future, Maitreya Buddha. So the Maitreya Buddha is after the, 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 the end of the time of the historical Buddha, Maitreya Buddha will come. So he's waiting for his time to come to this world to save all these peoples here. So this is a will of existence. Um, that's, this, this painting is going to be in the exhibition. I encourage you to take a closer look. Um, when it put up on there. So here, mandala of Chakra Samvara. So mandala are pictorial representations of, um, sometimes it could be the residence of particular god or goddess. Sometimes it represents a much general Buddhist concept of the Buddha's universe cosmos. So its creation, uh, the mandala's creation signifies the transformation of a universe of suffering into one of unity and interconnectedness. Um, so we see like all these different, very complicated uh, motifs are all connected with each other. So everything is connected and are not isolated. And this type of mandala are normally used as a visual aid or a guide for meditation. So when a student or a Buddhist disciple uh, meditate in front of them, sometimes with the instruction or guidance from a teacher, they will uh, look at look um, look at these mandala, different mandalas, step by step, and to eventually get to the central point to understand the major qualities of the teachings uh, represented by the figures here. So this particular mandala is a mandala of Chakra Samvara. We talk about Chakra Samvara, like uh, the two, the male god and the female goddess in the uh, embrace um, posture position. So Chakra Samvara um, is here. Uh, we will see it's also like depicted, I think. Himself. himself. So blue face, uh, four heads in different colors and 12 arms and two legs here is in the seat, position in the center. So these square-shaped walls represents the walls of his palace. Oops, what is that? Okay. Um, yeah, and these four gates are the four entrances to his palace. So all facing the cardin uh, cardinal directions. And there are all kinds of different uh, icons and different deities depicted which are important to understand his teaching and the quality, the power he represents. Um, so uh, there are also lots of uh, ritual implements used in uh, Tibetan um, Buddhism in Himalayan um, area. So here I, uh, put two photos of two most important uh, ritual objects. Uh, this one is uh, Vajra's uh, scepter, and this one is a bell. 
So these two and the other, the sometimes uh, prayers beads are considered the three most important uh, ritual uh, implements for uh, uh, Himalayan Buddhism. Uh, so we see the uh, Vedra and Vedra scepter and the bells are normally used together. So you will see lots of images like the god or goddess or sometimes like the teachers uh, are Buddhist holding these two on different hands. And this is a very typical uh, shaped Vajra scepter. So you normally have uh, these sometimes five, sometimes nine uh, prongs and all bent uh, towards the center and also um, shaped uh, and bent inward to fold a round enclosure and with this uh, narrow uh, waist connecting the two ends. So these two, like I mentioned, um, so, so we, we, we talk about like a different god and goddesses represents the different uh, qualities of Buddha's teaching of uh, so the two uh, ritual instruments is the same. They also represent, like the, um, the Vajra scepter represent the method, the compassionate action to attain um, uh, enlightenment. And the bell represents the wisdom, the weakening, um, the understanding of true reality. So this using this together is also a symbol, a symbolic meaning of the unity of the method and the wisdom. So the last time I'm going to talk about this painting. This painting is uh, is is used to um, to to pray for a uh, well beings to bless someone with good house um, in Tibetan um, culture. So this is also a mandala. We see like a mandala as uh, as a boat as a as a as a map as a visual representation of a particular god's uh, palace. So in the center, we see this uh, Buddha of medicine, medicine Buddha, because he's holding a medicine bow in his hand. So he's sitting in the center of his palace, like the walled, with a walled enclosure palace with four entrances as a four directions and surrounding him uh, a depiction, oops, a depictions of all different kind of plants, objects, and all serve some medical functions here. So medical Buddha, this mandala is a depiction of the event when the Buddha in the center is um, teaching his uh, ideas to the God, to human beings, to the, 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 the masters, to his disciples here below. And it's, it could also be used, some of the um, Buddhists also use this type of mandala to understand the holistic and the inclusive characteristic of Tibetan uh, medicine. So uh, there is a story talking about the Buddha sending out his disciples to the nature. They go outside and try to find one object that doesn't have any medical healing purposes. So the student went out and traveled all everywhere and but came back empty handed. He told the Buddha, I wouldn't be able to find anything that didn't have any um, medical purposes. Then the Buddha smiled, said, oh, your mission is accomplished because in um, Tibetan um, medicines, everything, everything we found in this nature has, uh, has some uh, healing and medical um, functions. So this is also like uh, understanding a symbolic uh, painting to represent this type of inclusive and also holistic idea of Tibetan um, uh, medical practices. I think that's all I will have for today's talk. There will be a lot more exciting and beautiful works in this exhibition. So when the show opens in February uh, 13th, please come visit and there will be lots of um, curators talk and we will have uh, scholars from Harvard University and the curator of this exhibition from the Ruby Museum who came, who will come to the Harn to give a lecture as well. So lots of exciting uh, events, activities. So I look forward to seeing you all in the gallery later. So we want to thank her very much for this talk, which I thought was incredibly informative. Certainly makes, makes me want to go see it when it actually arrives. Um, so we have time if anybody has any questions now. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was terrific. Um, it says pigments on cloth. Yes. Did they ever use paper? 
Uh, yeah, there are papers. You uh, you will see some manuscripts uh, made of papers, and uh, but most of the paintings are painted on cloth because it will be more durable. And also, uh, some of the paintings are portable. So when you move to different sections or to different temples to do your worship and practice, you can carry those um, cloth uh, paintings much more easily than the paper ones. Right. <clears throat> like the one we saw, the last one, the detail was phenomenal. I mean, how long would something like that take? And would it be done by one person? Were they signed? Was it a school? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a wonderful question. I think your, un your question will be um, best answered in the exhibition because there is a particular section showing the different stages of how this type of painting were made and the materials, the tools, and also including a video of the contemporary artist uh, paint, painting this work. So there we have an entire section to answer the question, but just very short answer here. And normally these type of works are painted in workshops. So that means like a group of artists work together. So someone like um, uh, have skills on um, painting figures, some painting the, the landscape paintings, some painted the accessories. So they all is kind of like a group work. And it also follow a very strict um, instructions and steps. Um, yeah, I think it took. I I wouldn't I wouldn't answer the exact how long it takes to produce this type of painting. I I I think it depends on the complexity of the motifs and the size of the paintings and different um, factors. Yeah, yeah, it didn't show any sizes on there. It would have been nice to get it. I mean, I have no idea. Like that last one, I yeah. don't know how big that is, but it was. Um, phenomenal <laughs> right right yeah that's um i think either that i i yeah i should have include the uh dimension uh for the artworks but some of the works the paintings are like uh, monumental paintings i think the will of the uh the will of the existence i think that that painting uh all the last painting you just mentioned are kind of uh very large it, it, it's gonna be like for it has its individual walls for the display yeah. Um, any more questions here? Okay, in that case, thank you so much. Thank and we'll you so see much you. for being here.